Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. As we begin our examination of Roman historiography, I feel it is important to take stock of where we've come to and to reconnect with some of the ideas that I mentioned at the outset of our course together. We recall that the word history is ambiguous in that it can refer both to events and to the account of events as written by a historian. Historians may be eyewitnesses of the events which they describe. More often, though, they rely on sources in the form of text, whether written or oral, stories, inscriptions, documents, the accounts of other historians. Thus, writing history, for which the term historiography is often used, generally involves the act of reading as well as that of interpretation. Yet historiography is itself an ambiguous term, since it may also denote the study of both the historian's work and more generally of the theory and history of historical writing. These various overlaps of terminology underline the fact, which scholars have come increasingly to realize, that in practice it is very difficult to separate the history of a given period, that is, the events, the things that happened, from its historiography, that is, the texts in which those events are retold and analyzed, a difficulty which in its turn gives rise to various further problems. Original events no longer exist, except insofar as they leave traces, either physical, a temple, a coin, an aqueduct, or literary, in the form of texts written either soon afterwards, such as a commemorative inscription, the text of a law, or long after, the history of the early Roman Republic, written several centuries later by a mid-Republican histor historian. It is from these traces that modern historians construct their stories about what happened in the ancient world. And these stories are essentially no more than possible models of a vanished world, whether they take the form of what may be called analytical history, that is the study of a particular topic or period from one of a number of different viewpoints concerning um, economic or cultural aspects, or narrative history, that is the retelling uh, of, a, of the history of a given period, or uh, of a given people in story form, using conventions similar to those of a traditional novel. But texts, be they ancient or modern, are slippery things. Both physically, crucial ancient texts may be filled with holes, corrupt, or they may only exist as a paraphrase by a later author. But they're also slippery philosophically. The meanings of words are not fixed, and any given text can be interpreted differently by different generations of readers. Even if we believe, and not all scholars do, that with care we can come close to knowing how an original audience might have understood an ancient text, we are still left with the fact that that text is not a piece of plate glass through which to view the ancient world, but is only one version of that world, one writer's interpretation now filtered through centuries of copying, scholarly attention, and our own expectations, levels of knowledge, and ways of reading. Because so much of the ancient uh, evidence for vanished of events is itself contestable, and because any story that a historian writes itself forms a text that may be later used to construct a new model of these vanished events, the form of a text can contribute as much to its meaning as does its content. And if, under the word form, we include such intangible elements as the political context in which a text was written, the likely bias of the author, though, as we will see, this is often a matter of continuing debate, uh, the literary expectations of any original audience, and finally the norms and codes of the genre of history writing itself, if we can kind of put all of that under the form, then it becomes clear that the way a story is told is as important as the story itself, and indeed it is part of the story itself. The situation that I've just outlined here generally obtains for anyone trying to read or to reconstruct the history of ancient Rome as Tim Cornell, 
great British historian of ancient Rome points out in his monumental history of early Rome that was published in 1995, he, called The Beginnings of Rome, he says, quote, the most important evidence for the early history of Rome comes from literary sources. If the history and historiography of Rome are therefore interdependent, it is clearly of great importance to know how the Romans wrote their history. A historian such as Livy, who we will be studying in two lectures time after this, and who lives several centuries after many of the events which he purports to describe, he relied on a succession of earlier writers, writing in both Latin and Greek, many of whom are merely names to us, but some of whom their work has survived uh, in various degrees, such as Fabius Pictor, Gaius Achilles, Postumius Albinus, the elder Cato, Polybius, Cassius Hamina, Calpurnius Piso, Gaius Fanius, Gnaeus Gellius, Coelius Antipater, Sempronius Asselio, Claudius Quadregarius, Valerius Antius, Cornelius Cicena, Licinius Macer, Aelius Tubero, Asinius Polio, and the man who we will be learning about in our next lecture, Sallust. Not all of these men wrote the same kind of history. Among them, they represent two essentially different types. On the one hand, history of a relatively short, well-defined period, often a war, such as that of Coelius, uh, who wrote on the Second Punic War, or of Cicena, who wrote on the Social War and afterwards. And then on the other hand, we have historians who wrote histories of Rome from its foundation, what the Latins would have called ab urbe condita, from the foundation of the city, or sometimes a remo et romulo, from Romulus and Remus. And these would include the annals of writers such as Antius and Macher, whom I just mentioned. There is also a third type, a universal history, which treated all parts of the inhabited world, the so-called oikumene. Uh, since Roman history was a at heart local history, this genre developed late in Rome, although the man whom we learned about most recently, Polybius, whose work covers the period of 220 to 146 BC at Rome um, and throughout the Mediterranean, he thought of himself as a universal historian. Nearly all of this work, though, as I said, is lost or survives only in fragmentary form. We do know, however, that the careers of these writers covers cover the, the period of roughly 200 BC to roughly 35 BC. But since the traditional date for the foundation of Rome, 753 BC, is you know the middle of the 8th century, we are left with an an interval of over 500 years, during which no history was written in Rome at all. Where then did the earliest historians derive their information from for the earliest centuries of Rome? Well, the traditional story of how history grew at Rome is the story told to us by Cicero and elaborated by later critics. It is a dismal tale, as it were, of plain, unadorned, thin narratives, a mere analium confectio, a compilation of chronicles, as Cicero calls it in his De Oratore, Book 2, 52. Uh, and Cicero even says that it, it was merely, history at Rome was merely just that, a compilation of chronicles, even up through his own day. And in this dialogue, he imagines his friend Atticus begging him to remedy that situation by writing history himself. Um, and uh, he, th that is imagined actually in his work, De Legibus, Book 1, 5 through 9. According to this picture, Roman history began with the lost Annales Maximi, a year-by-year -year chronicle that is said to have been posted for public view on tabulae de albatae, or white boards, in the forum. And this would be later codified in some form, perhaps as a large inscription, and maintained by the high priest of Rome, the Pontifex Maximus. This work, the, uh, the, which is, as I said, lost, the Annales, is said to have dated back perhaps to the 5th century BC, uh, although that is disputed. We certainly uh, are a much firmer ground dating it 
back more to the 300s. Um, but it is said to have contained the names of annual magistrates and other officials and notices of famines and eclipses and of primarily ritualistic material. Yet even if the earliest historians had access to a record which predated themselves by so long of a time, there still remains a period of centuries, for many centuries, three centuries from the foundation of the city, um, for which no information other than some form of traditional memory was available, but which an author such as Livy nevertheless took four books to describe. That is more than 300 pages in the traditional Oxford classical text series. And if we go even further with that, even if they were to, to use the annales uh, of these priests, we should not be optimistic about the reliability either of the information transmitted by the Annales Maximi or of the use which historians may have made of this information. Uh, a careful investigator of the Annales, uh, of, published about 40 years ago, uh, concluded the following. He says, We ought, I think, to envision the pontifical chronicle as a gigantic, poorly formatted, difficult to read inscription on bronze, probably consisting of several individual bronze tabulae or plates, incised by a variety of hands, which may well have been awkwardly positioned, and perhaps in the later stages of its life even plagued with gaps. At some point, it is quite possible that some sort of restoration was carried out, which may have adulterated the original records. One visualizes a conscientious consulting historian standing before this mass of data with wax tablet in hand. As he reads on, he finds that it is loaded with uninteresting prodigies, famines, eclipses, and the like, all listed under eponymous magistrates. Eventually, perhaps, he gives up in disgust as the more interesting and certainly more easily and comfortably consulted accounts of the first analysts who had been forced to consult the chronicle became available. People ceased standing in the elements, craning their necks to read a lot of banal entries. Two points in this conclusion deserve emphasis, I think. The first is the uninteresting and banal nature of the record, which in both content and form is far removed from even the minimum requirements of narrative history. The second is the extreme difficulty of consulting the record, the consensus of modern research is that the Romans had a persistent disregard for the retrieval of information, which no doubt explains the commonly accepted view that Roman historians did not, as a general rule, carry out original research. As far as we can tell, in fact, from the very beginning, historians of early Rome primarily used other written histories as sources, modeling their own work on and polemically engaging with their predecessors in ways generally familiar to us from the work of poets. The earliest Roman historian, Fabius Pictor, who wrote in Greek, looked, as again Tim Cornell has remarked, to the canons and methods of Greek historiography, using Greek accounts of early Rome as his source. Later writers reacted both to Greek historians, and once Cato the Elder had invented a prose style for Latin and written history in it, to the growing prose tradition in their own language. Roman historians did on occasion consult the research of others, conveniently grouped under the general heading of antiquarians by modern scholars. Even here, however, it does not follow that their methods were the same as ours. For instance, Livy famously refers to auctores, or sources, in the plural, when he usually means a single source. And it has been argued that many other scholarly conventions of historiographical narrative are purely mendacious. What is more, as Cicero and Livy knew, antiquarian genealogical research was itself often characterized by distortion and outright free invention. Cicero mentions this in his work, The Brutus, chapter 62, and Livy in his work, chap book 8, chapter 40, fourth revive. Finally, none of these possible sources for early Roman history provided more than a bare-bones structure, nothing like the elaborate narratives we find in Livy and others. 
It is certainly true that by the time Fabius Pictor wrote, the Romans had a highly developed sense of their past, and it has been argued that the remarkably coherent account of early Roman history found in the extant sources can only be explained as relying on the collective and accepted oral memory of the nation. That is, oral tradition and the fierce Roman sense of identity themselves constituted an important source for early Rome. And as Tim Cornell has reminded us, this sense of the past is not unproblematic. The historical tradition of the Re Roman Republic was not an authenticated official record or an objective critical reconstruction. Rather, it was an ideological construct designed to control, to justify, and to inspire. So although the problem of the content and form of the Annales did not arise for authors writing the history of their own time, the fact that ancient historians were not researchers, the often problematic status of the research which they sometimes consulted, and the markedly nationalistic and ideological nature of the traditions in which they lived and worked, all have profound implications for our modern understanding of the kind of literature they produced. However, it is fairly safe to assume that until about 50 years ago, the fundamental differences between ancient and modern historians, especially with regard to their respective assumptions about the truth value of their narratives, was largely ignored. A, clear, a clear classic example is provided by Cicero's dialogue De Oratore on the Orator, produced in the year 55 BC, but set in the year 91 BC. Cicero, in this dialogue, surveying the early Roman historians, this is in Book 2, chapters 51 through 54, found them deficient when compared with their Greek predecessors, and he therefore set out the model, the methods by which proper history should be written. This is from chapter 62 through 4. Everyone accepts that Cicero's passage provides crucial evidence for the nature of Roman historiography. And when discussing this in his 1979 uh, work, uh, the distinguished Oxford historian P.A. Brunt concluded the following, quote, Cicero is not expressly advocating a type of historical exposition different from that commonly employed by modern political historians. You see, there was a basic assumption that uh, there was essentially no real difference fundamentally between ancient and modern historians. And such an attitude was entirely typical of its time in studies such as those of Usher, 1969, Michael Grant, 1970, C.W. Fornara in 1983. It was stated or implied that history had altered but little over the course of time. And the same attitudes uh, underlie what modern historians themselves wrote about the history of ancient Rome, as did the writers of the ancient world themselves about the Roman Republic and Empire. However, in the same year as Brunt's statement appeared, T.P. Wiseman published his book known as Clio's Cosmetics. Clio, of course, is the muse of history. Uh, this was a book that really has become a kind of landmark in the study of the ancient Roman historians. Wiseman argued that the Romans practiced in our terms what he calls unhistorical thinking, that their historians were profoundly different from ours in that they assimilated historiography to poetry and oratory. That is, it was another type of genre of literature. And in particular, he argued that the early Roman historians, upon whom the later ones were so dependent, resorted to pure invention on a large scale. If we compare the paucity and unreliability of the evidence for early Roman history with the scale of Livy's work, you know, over 130 volumes, Wiseman's conclusions seem not only reasonable, but even almost inevitable. Yet, so disquieting an argument could not fail but to provoke a reaction. And so it was in 1982, while acknowledging that the book, uh, that is Wiseman's book, raised important and challenging questions, uh, Tim Cornell offered an extended critique of the book and explicitly gave his support back to Brunt and the traditional view. But Wiseman stuck to his guns. 
although Tim Cornell returned to the issue again in 1986 and afterwards, and he's still alive, uh, although retired, and he has maintained, maintained his position in his subsequent writing. However, in 1988, this traditional view, as articulated by Brunt and maintained by Cornell, was confronted directly by A.G. Woodman in his book, Rhetoric and Classical Historiography. He argued that when Roman historians in their prefaces profess to be telling the truth, they are denying bias and not, in our terms, fabrication. That is, their idea of truth did not preclude the idea of pure invention. And Woodman provided a systematic analysis of Cicero's De Oratore, Book 2, Chapter 62 through 4, which showed that Cicero was, in a sense, recommending for historiography to utilize oratorical techniques, including inventio, invention. Uh, these techniques, which were advocated in the rhetorical handbooks of the Hellenistic and Roman period. Although Woodman's book, too, enjoyed something of a mixed reception, its detailed exposition of ancient historiographical theory corroborated Wiseman's hypothesis and ensured that the debate on the nature of Roman historical writing would continue, and indeed it has to our time. Yet this debate has been conducted largely in the pages of, and footnotes of scholarly monographs and academic periodicals, with only a severely restricted impact, if any, on material which is readily accessible to teachers and students in schools. And so uh, my lectures, and over, especially over the next three lectures when we'll be discussing the Roman historians, Salas, Livy, and Tacitus, uh, that really is not the place to repeat the arguments which have already been made elsewhere, but it is of great importance simply to highlight them and um, uh, and to note that reader, readers of ancient history, students of ancient history, should be aware that the very nature of Roman historiography has been subjected to severe questioning and that that debate still continues. And so in the following lectures on Sallust, Livy, and Tacitus, and others, uh, it will be taken for granted, from my own perspective, that the views broadly associated with Wiseman and Woodman are correct. Uh, it is also going to be taken for granted in what I have to say that since these ancient texts are as much literary works as they are historical works, a literary approach in which one reads for structure, style, and theme, among other things, can offer new insights into the way these historians saw their past and their present, and indeed into the use which we today can make uh, of their work. And finally, just kind of uh, as sort of a postscript, um, I would just like to turn our attention to a brief consideration of what, if anything, can be said about the now fragmentary work of these earlier historians whom I've mentioned. From the often exiguous remains of their work, we can sometimes see points of contact and, intriguingly, difference with extant writers like Sallust, Livy, and Tacitus. Uh, that is, there are some passages which uh, have been uh, quoted by later authors whose work survives of these very, very early fragmentary writers. And that's what we mean by fragmentary. They're, we're not talking about physical fragments. We're talking about quotations and later authors of these earlier historians whose names I listed before. And sometimes what we can see, we can put them side by side with the treatment of the same exact um, topics in later historians such as Salus, Livy, and Tacitus. And it, the differences are really quite remarkable, especially vis-a-vis -vis this uh, this question of, uh, you know, invention of how much of the details are being augmented and increased and kind of, um, you know, embroidered. The best known examples uh, of, of overlap between the earlier fragmentary historians and later, uh, the, the later major authors are two. One of them concerns uh, a passage that is quoted uh, by Aulus Gellius of the earlier fragmentary historian Lucius Calpurnius Paizo Frugi, simply referred to as Paizo. Uh, and uh, it is the story of the ideal Gnaeus Flavius, which you can read if you'd like to pause the video and just read that. That, that 
terse and very, very uh, kind of minimal anecdote is then worked up by Livy in the very long section that you see in front of you. Uh, you can read that on your own. I'm going to uh, skip the, to the to the second, which is a, a second pair of these two. That is a quotation from the earlier uh, historian Quintus Claudius Quadragarius, uh, who wrote in the uh, earlier part of the first century BC, he wrote in Annales, uh, an annals, a historical account, and again, very terse, very brief. That, in a, But then uh, in the passage gets picked up and elaborated by Livy into a full-blown anecdote and a full-blown section, and it's really quite, um, it, it, it really is very illustrative of the kind of amplification of these earlier writers that takes place. So I'm just going to read both of those passages to you right now, of that second pair, um, because it really is a textbook analysis of the stylistic development found in, um, uh, you know, of just what we're talking about, of this amplification in among later authors. So this is what the earlier writer says. This is quoted for us by this author, Aulus Gellius, writing in the second century AD, but he's quoting this earlier first century BC, Quintus Claudius Quadragarius, who tells the story of one uh, Manlius Torquatus, uh, a, a man, Titus Manlius Torquatus, who he received this this last name, the, the, this cognomen, or really ognomen nickname, Torquatus, and it became the cognomen of his family. He received it. Uh, the word itself means uh, decked out with a necklace. Okay, <laughs> uh, tor uh, uh, tor Torquatus means one who is wearing a necklace. Um, and Quadragarius tells the story of how he how he got this nickname. And it was in the time in the fourth century when the Gauls were attacking the, the city of Rome. And um, the dictator of Rome, the, which is an official position of Rome, uh, leads out the army to go and fight the Gauls. And a single Gaul comes forward. Uh, we can just read this together. In the meantime, a Gaul came forward who was naked except for a shield and two swords and the ornament of a neck chain and bracelets in size and strength. In youthful vigor and in courage as well, he excelled all the rest. In the very height of the battle, when the two armies were fighting with the utmost ardor, he began to make signs with his hand to both sides to cease fighting. The combat ceased. As soon as silence was secured, he called out in a mighty voice, that if anyone wished to engage him in single combat, he should come forward. This no one dared do, because of his huge size and savage aspect. Then the Gaul began to laugh at them and to stick out his tongue. This at once roused the great indignation of one Titus Manlius, a youth of the highest birth, that such an insult should be offered his country, and that no one from so great an army should accept the challenge. He, as I say, stepped forth, and would not suffer Roman valor to be shamefully tarnished by a Gaul. Armed with a foot soldier's shield and a Spanish sword, that is the standard Gladius Hispaniensis of ancient Rome, he confronted the Gaul. Their meeting took place at the on the very bridge in the presence of both armies amid great apprehension. Thus they confronted each other, as I said before, the Gaul, according to his method of fighting with shield advanced and awaiting an attack, Manlius, relying on courage rather than skill, struck shield against shield and threw the Gaul off his balance. While the Gaul was trying to regain the same position, Manlius again struck shield against shield and again forced the man to change his ground. In this fashion he slipped in under the Gaul's sword and stabbed him in the breast with his Spanish blade. Then at once, with the same mode of attack, he struck the, his enemy's right shoulder, and he did not give ground at all until he overthrew him, without giving the Gaul a chance to strike a blow. After he had overthrown him, he cut off his head, tore off his neck chain, and put it, covered with blood as it was, around his own neck. Because of this act, he himself and his descendants had the surname Torquatus, decked out with a necklace. Okay, so that's the original um, historian. That that was the source that Livy, this later author whose work uh, does not survive intact, but huge sections of it still do survive, and we're going to be examining it. Now, he takes that kind of terse and very kind of minimal sort of anecdote, and he and he 
blows it up into a much larger story, uh, much much more descriptive. And it really is illustrative, as I said, of the stylistic development that we see. Uh, and we can only imagine that, some, that this is basically the paradigm of what took place, that a lot of these later authors whose work to survive, working, they, they were reworking material and kind of making it more rhetorical, more dramatic, more embellished. Living. In face of this sudden and alarming inroad, the dictator proclaimed a suspension of all business and made every man who was liable to serve take the military oath. He marched out of the city with an immense army and fixed his camp on this side of the Anya, that's the river. Each side had left the bridge between them intact, as its destruction might have been thought, due to fears of an attack. There were frequent skirmishes for the procession of the for the possession of the bridge. As these were indecisive, the question was left unsettled. A Gaul of extraordinary stature strode forward on to the un unoccupied bridge, and shouting as loudly as he could, cried, Let the bravest man that Rome possesses come out and fight me that we too may decide which people is the superior in war. A long silence followed. The best and bravest of the Romans made no sign. They felt ashamed of appearing to decline the challenge, and yet they were reluctant to expose themselves to such terrible danger. Thereupon Titus Manlius, the youth who had protected his father from the persecution of the tribune, left his post and went to the dictator. Without your orders, general, he said, I will never leave my post to fight, no, not even if I saw that victory was certain. But if you give me permission, I want to show that monster, as he stalks so proudly in front of their lines, that I am a scion of that family which hurled the troop of Gauls from the Tarpeian rock. Then the dictator, success to your courage, Titus Manlius, and to your affection for your father and your fatherland. Go and with the help of the gods, show that the name of Rome is invincible. Then his comrades fastened on his armor. He took an infantry shield and a Spanish sword, as better adapted for close fighting. Thus armed and equipped, they led him forward against the Gaul, who was exulting in his brute strength. And even the ancients thought this worth of recording, putting his tongue out in derision. They retired to their posts, and the two armed champions were left alone in the midst, more after the manner of a scene on the stage than under the conditions of serious war, and to those who judged by appearances, by no means equally matched. The one was a creature of enormous bulk, resplendent in a many-colored coat, and wearing painted and gilded armor. The other was a creature uh, the other uh, a man of average height and his arms uh, <clears throat> useful rather than ornamental gave him quite an ordinary appearance there was no singing of war songs no prancing about no silly brandishing of weapons with a breast full of courage and silent wrath manliness reserved all his ferocity for the actual moment of conflict when they had taken their stand between the two armies while so many hearts around them were in suspense between hope and fear, the Gaul, like a great overhanging mass, held out his shield on his left arm to meet his adversary's blows and aimed a tremendous cut downwards with his sword. The Roman evaded the blow, and pushing aside the bottom of the Gaul's shield with his own, he slipped under it close to the Gaul, too near for him to get at him with his sword. Then turning the point of his blade upwards, he gave two rapid thrusts in succession and stabbed the Gaul in the belly and the groin, laying his enemy prostrate over a large extent of ground. He left the body of his fallen foe undespoiled, that is, he didn't strip his armor, with the exception of his chain, which, though smeared with blood, he placed round his own neck. Astonishment and fear kept the Gauls motionless. The Romans ran eagerly forward from their lines to meet their warrior, and amidst cheers and congratulations, they conducted him to the dictator. In the doggerel verses which they extemporized in his honor, they called him Torquatus, adorned with a chain, and this sobriquet became for his posterity a proud family name. 
the dictator gave him a golden crown, and before the whole army alluded to his victory in terms of the highest praise. Really, really rousing stuff. Makes you want to go out and beat up some Gauls, I guess. But um, you can see that the the level of amplification and putting in dialogue and, you know, uh, so many other details that are just not there in the original at all and are purely um, uh, invented. There's no other word for it. Um, we we read, and he even, and, and Livy even mentions, that he, he tells his source, right? He, he says, the ancients even thought worthy of recording this fact that the Gaul had stuck out his tongue. So we, we we know exactly the passage he was working from, and that was the passage of Quadrigarius. And yet he puts in at least three times more information than is there in the original. That is just purely invented. And obviously for a nationalistic purpose, right, it makes you feel really patriotic about being Roman and, you know, uh, honoring your father, all of the stuff that's in, that's just not there in the original. Many of the fragments, should, I've, only, I've chosen this one as the, to illustrate the point, but many of the fragments from what we can find, what we do still have, show that the earlier historians shared uh, concerns with the with the, the later authors, um, and indeed these earlier writers working with native Roman or Italian traditions and with the great texts of Greek historiography certainly define the parameters and questions with which their genre would concern itself. Um, but we definitely see an expansion, okay? We see an, uh, a huge amount of embellishment. But these issues, these parameters, these questions with which the genre of historiography would concern itself would be taken up and challenged and modified by the later authors, the major authors of Roman historiography. And these, nevertheless, keep quite close to the general outlines of the field as laid out by their precursors. Primary among these concerns are questions of self-definition, firstly of the historian. What is his history to take? What form is it to take? Uh, should it be annal? Should it be a monograph? Should it be an account of a foundation of a city? Uh, what items is the author to include and what to avoid? Uh, of what value is his own experience in politics or war? And of what value is the work he is producing? Roman culture put considerable pressure on intellectuals in all fields to show that their work had practical justification and application. Uh, the Romans were relentlessly practical in some ways. And so literature for it to be taken seriously had to be useful. And so what, what, what use was the story of Rome? That was a question that every historian of Rome had to kind of wrestle with. Secondly, these historians address the question of the self-definition of Rome itself. The history of Rome was essentially the history of a single city, which over the span of a thousand years grew to include within itself the boundaries of most of the known world. The resulting influx of foreign peoples, languages, and ideas already was an issue by the Middle Republic, and it posed problems of self-identity. What does it mean to be a Roman? A more specific concern, especially from the perspective of the earliest historians, who were, every one of them, engaged in politics and the military, was public life and the res publica, the relations between the ruling elite and the populace and the shifting boundaries of the ruling class, which, like the empire it controlled, gradually grew to encompass more and more outsiders, and all of these were of primary importance and paramount concern for the uh, authors of Roman history. Politics and the military continued to hold center stage, though, as the empire grew. Individual actors became increasingly important, though. These powerful new leaders can be seen emerging already in early historiography, that is, in these fragmentary writers, but they become especially of concern for the three major authors we're going to be studying, Sallust, Livy, and under the empire, Tacitus. Whatever the focus, however, the structure of the state itself was always visible, as the historians reported, with varying degrees of emphasis or belief. Um, religious ritual and prodigies, the annual change of magistracies, the diplomatic interaction between Rome and its allies or enemies, the development or change of institutions, the passing of laws and decrees, all of those things are going to become uh, 
We're going to see our, our there. They were there from the very beginning of Roman historiography, and they will be there to the very end. Their standard themes and uh, topics. And actually, it is in these passages, but they're often simple list format and reporting of information basic to the functioning of the state, that the origins of Latin historiography, that is the annales maxime, make their spirit, if not their actual influence, felt. And so I think with all of that, we are ready to kind of embark upon our uh, next group of lectures on the Roman historians. We will trace many of these themes and questions uh, that I've just articulated, uh, and we will see how they were elaborated in the in the work uh, of the historians which has survived. Thank you.